Hello, Moto America fans. Welcome to this latest edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. We are at New Jersey Motorsports Park in Millville, New Jersey, southern part of New Jersey. Um, it's close to Delaware, actually. Uh, and people around here act like they're all from Philadelphia, which is odd. But um, it's our last round of our season. And I want to just say we're putting this one in the can because... My, the, our communications manager on the other side there, Paul Carruthers, is getting married. So he's going to be out of commission for a little bit while he's on his honeymoon. So we needed to get somebody on this podcast. And who better than our, the, our one of the Crave partners and our chief operating officer, Chuck Axland. And we're going to just drill him with all kinds of questions. So welcome, Chuck. Thanks for being on with us again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks uh, for having me. It's been a year since I was on here last time. That's so right. This is our tradition, we, I guess. It's a tradition that we meet in this room and you tell us stuff that we didn't even know. <laughs> That's or, right. or you already know and, you, <laughs> That's and right. we make the rest up. <laughs> yeah, it's State of the Union, like Paul <laughs> yeah. said. So. State of the Union, except the president's at home. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. <laughs> um, kind of happens now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I want to start this. I'm actually going to I want to first congratulate you Chuck on 10 years of Moto America. I mean, it's that's incredible. Um I want to ask about this decade. Um this is going to be a Barbara Walters like question a little bit, but <laughs> what what are you most proud of after 10 years with Moto America? Well, first I think we should all of us should be correct congratulated because it's not just me, it's a big effort, you know. Right. You guys included and you know, uh, Nicole and the ops team and, you know, just everybody. It's a big team. Larry, our TV production, all the participants and fans have supported us. So uh, I think it's all of us should be congratulated, really. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What's what to be most proud of? It's uh, that's a tough one because yeah. it's it's uh, it's hard to believe that it's been 10 years already. It's flown by. Um, I remember when we announced it and our race was. Um, I think we announced it about September 5th of 2014, and we had no schedule, no rules, no real plan. And and I remember having, I remember Paul's early conversations about how do we do this. Right. <laughs> so, but um, you know, come from from back then to where we are now, it's uh, and being able to grow every year. You know, I think I think just the fact that we have grown each and every year with the participants, the fans, the social media coverage, television coverage. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever be satisfied and could say, yeah, we're we're happy where we are, but I think uh, the progression's been good and, and we're in a good place now and looking forward to the future. Like this morning, I was standing over there and, and you know, move-in day is always kind of cool because, you know, people are more relaxed and coming in. But when you, when you, when I just watched semi after semi after semi after semi in 2015, if we, if we, if we thought that far ahead, I mean, we'd be pretty pleased at the point at that point. So no, I, you no, know, 100%. Like I think that first year we probably had four semis. Maybe, you know? yeah, maybe. And I think we're close to twenty with everything, everything right. that's here now. So, yeah, that's 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 pretty cool. I mean, I agree with you. It's incredible that it's been it, ten years have, have gone by this quickly. And from your perspective, we know about your obviously your background um, in GP with Kenny Roberts and w working with that team and all the things you, you've done over the years. Has this 10 years been similar to what it was like for you in, in the roles you had in the past? Or was this kind of like a new frontier for you with a lot of things? <laughs> Definitely a new frontier. Yeah. Well, but I think um, probably all of my experience has led me to, to, you know, to do something like this, to be honest. You know, <clears throat> being on the team side, you know, I raced a little bit myself. Right. So I've been on that side of the fence, uh, although not for a long time. But and then running Kenny's team, and especially, you know, the exposure of the world championship and the professionalism of, of that over there. <clears throat> um, and then after I came back from Grand Prix, having the opportunity to work at Coda and build up a track and run, you know, help run events, be a part of some pretty large events, actually, uh, to this. Um, so it's, for whatever reason, it's kind of been a natural progression, but you know, the series, because there's so many different elements to it and so many different players and, you know, everything from, you know, your your track arrangement deal to what classes you're going to run to how your registration works to television to the whole thing. It's just, uh, you know, it's completely different experiences, to, to be honest. So, um, but it's just been a evolution on my side really so it's 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 been good I, I like i enjoy learning new things which 
every day there's something new that pops up here in the series, you know, whether it's a team or a issue or, or something good or a new class or, you know, what are we going to be doing in the future? You know, a lot of our thought process is what's the next five years going to look like, you know, for classes and, you know, how's, how's for instance, what Superbike's going to develop into, you know, with the next gen class and what other categories are out there, you know, wanting to get in and so forth. So, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a challenge, but it's a, it's a good challenge. You know, that brings up one thing related to this that I, I want to ask you. So, you know, Moto America has evolved quite a bit in 10 years. I mean, our class structures and things like that. Um, not a huge amount. There's kind of a core of what the, what the series is, but you know, there, there've been some changes. Has it been change for change sake or has it been changed because change has been warranted by certain things and i'm talking about obviously we got a twins cup class that we didn't have in the beginning and you know the way super stock well it's stock 1000 now but there are some things that are a little different than they were when they start we started yeah there's a few things twins is probably a big addition to it you know when we started we had super bikes and stock well then it was super stock thousand running together and there were some reasons why that worked and and didn't work ultimately um but really, you know, at that time we had our KTM Cup, um, and you know, to go from that to a super sport bike was quite a big jump. And the twins category kind of fit into that that progression for for a rider. Um, uh, you know, then opportunities obviously come up with the King of the Baggers and the Hooligans and Build Train Race, which they all have their you know unique things that enhance the series on its own. Um, so. Yeah, again, it just kind of, you know, some of it's dependent on the market. Some of it's dependent on what we think is good entertainment value for the series. So, The classes, do you see, I mean, we can't have any more. We, we can't <laughs> we hardly know. do what we have. Right, right. I mean, honestly, that we'll, we'll get into the schedule here in a minute, but probably the most difficult part of the schedule is once you have the events, figuring out which classes are going to race at which events. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we've we made the decision a couple of years ago to to, to and, it, and it really stemmed from everybody that wanted to go to an event, wanted to race twice. Um, so to do that, we broke up the schedule to where, you know, Stock Thousand runs. The sport classes run at some races, but they don't run at the others. Um, but, you know, even by doing that with the demand of, you know, we have requests now for other classes to be added. But we just, you know, until we start adding more and more events, the, we just don't have enough time in the day, to be honest. This, um, I want to talk about the Talent Cup a little bit. Uh, I know, Paul, you were going to mention that. Too, sorry about <laughs> no, that. I'm stealing his thunder. Well, right. I, you know, because I want to talk about, it, I, I've heard about this. I, I don't know if you've told me Wayne said it or I've heard it, but. Kind of in the beginning, this talent cup is sort of something that you wanted, you guys wanted to do when you first kind of conceived of how Moto America was going to be. Am I right about that? Well, the reason this whole thing got started was because Richard Varner asked Wayne the question, where's, you know, the next American world champions are going to come from? And uh, that ultimately led to the opportunity to take over to the AMA Superbike Series. But that was always our ambition was to try and create a platform that riders, you know, to give the riders opportunity to go to Europe. And, um, you know, for a variety of different reasons, you know, part of it that Dorna don't recognize production street bikes as, as a road to MotoGP in the road to MotoGP program. Um, you know, it hasn't, we haven't found the right solution until now, to be honest. You know, we, we, we've tried to work with Honda to have NSF 250s. We were close to having a, a program with KTM, you know, to you know come into place this year you know because they do have a really good ladder uh, throughout the whole moto gp platform <clears throat> to to develop riders but now we found a solution with kramer and a 350 and it's recognized by moto gp and it's part of the road to moto gp program and, and it took us 10 years but yeah ultimately we're kind of back to our what we set out to do to yeah, be honest you wanted that's the plan that you wanted to do yeah, yeah. and i mean there was the ktm rc cup and the junior cup i mean it was all great racing and it really did develop some young riders that are now you know moving through the up the ladder with us and everything sure. but but we get the fact that it's production um what led to the fact like what led to it being junior cup and i'm not even thinking about rc cup because that was kind of spec what led to the production part of it? Was there something where there was an influence or by any manufacturers? 
well, in the very beginning, KTM had the interest for the RC390 Cup. Right. But, you know, coming back to what, you know, a production street bike versus a production race bike, which like the Honda 250 is a production race bike. And a lot of the other Talent Cup series around the world use the 250 as Honda as, the, as a platform. But that was not available to us. And it wasn't, hasn't been available to us up until, you know, just after we signed a deal with Kramer, then Honda came and said, you know, why don't you take a look at the no Honda kidding. 250. Yeah. Wow. But, but it was already, it was too late, basically. Yeah. Um, but I think the Kramer 350 with the direction that MotoGP is going in the future with the age limits for, you know, becoming involved in the Moto3. Now you can't race in the Moto3 program until you're 18 years old. Um, so if we could start on the Kramer 350 when you're 14, uh, if you're talented enough to, to you know, because the top five in the series have the opportunity to try out for the Red Bull rookies, you run that and you're 15, 16 years old, it kind of, you know, I think it's a better transition to uh, to get to Grand Prix. It's a, it's providing the opportunity. You know, if a, if a kid wants to run the Talent Cup for one or two years, doesn't make it to the rookies and wants to come back. We have a place for him to do that. Come back to Super Sport or Twins or whatever too. So, isn't I think Jensen Beeler was saying that possibly Moto three, the Moto three bikes are going to change next year. Uh, they're looking at some changes for twenty twenty seven. Oh, okay, yeah. down yeah. the road a little yeah. bit. Okay. Yeah. So I think now the challenge is just, I mean, obviously we've come out with the class, we've shown the bike, we've talked about how cool the bike is, we've talked about the road to Moto GP. Now it's just making sure we can get these kids to make that decision. And, mm. and, and some of them may opt to do another route. Um, but obviously we, ha we want those good kids to be in talent cup because that's where they're. Yeah. I think, I think the important thing from our side is we gave them a choice. You know, they have a, they have the opportunity if they want to do that and then great. If they don't, then, you know, it's their, their, their choice. Not every kid wants to be the world champion. You know, right. some do aspire to be a Moto America Superbike champion. But if you talk to these guys, like uh, Sean Dillon Kelly, for example, I mean, he will tell you that riding those bikes, even if you don't want to be Moto GP world champion, it makes you a better super sport rider sure. and ultimately a better superbike rider. And it, it, it goes to different levels. Yeah, 100%. I would agree with that for sure. But I think some kids, I think we're going to have to get to the point where the, the those kids don't think that that's a step back instead of a step forward, like they perceive maybe Twins Cup being or Super Sport. Right. Yeah. But I think that's just going to fall into place based on. Yeah, and I think you know from when we announced the the class and this had a description of the bike, you know, we had a lot of interest right away. Now people have seen the bike, you know, we're we're confident. You know, the demand is already there with the number of inquiries and deposits that are down. But there's a class, <clears throat> so. Um, I think you're going to see a, a good field next year, and hopefully a lot of them are the 14-, 15-year-old kids that want to aspire to go go on. And I think the, the age limit change with MotoGP is a good thing because I think it takes – I think <clears throat> you don't want to have so much pressure that you're a 14-year-old kid and you're like, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm done, because there's a 14-year-old in Spain that's better than me or in Italy that's better than me. This way they have a little more time to mature with this these bikes before they have to face that. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with that. But hopefully we find the 14, 15-year-olds here that want to go over there and, and recognize that, hey, I could take the Spanish on, I can take the Italians on. Right, but what I'm saying is that it gives them a couple of years here. Sure. They don't have to feel like they've got to go there when they're 14 and a half or 15 years old. No, not necessarily, but you're still, <laughs> you know, if you have a super talented kid here at 14 and he goes to the Red Bull Rookies at 15 and yeah. wins the Red Bull Rookies championship. Perfect. You know, that's, right. that's, that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. And I think that Red Bull Rookies thing, I mean, looking at it, if, if it was me and I was a dad or a kid, that's the biggest, that's the best part of the puzzle. It's a good carrot for, for sure. You know, now you have, you know, we have quite a few, I think there's five kids that are trying out for the Red Bull Rookies this year, mm -hmm. actually, for, for next year's program. A lot of those came up from the Volley program, the, you know, our Mini Cup or the FIM Mini Cup. Uh, those kids and families have been, you know, running around in England or, you know, British championship or the European championship for the last, you know, they're over there two, three years, you know, here you could, you don't have to do that. You know, if, if you could go straight from here, try out for the rookies and have a shot. So hopefully we could save some, some, uh, family, some money, right. It's an expensive, uh, proposition to move everything and, you know, fly back and forth to, to hone your skills at that age for sure. Yeah. You know, so here's a tough question for you, Chuck. Um, 
I've been this one's been rattling around in my head a little bit because just in, again in talking to Jensen Beeler, you know, he's mentioned a lot about the adjustability of the bike and the fact that you can set it up in a few different ways. So it, it seems to me this class is going to be made up of probably some families, some some fathers and mothers and their kid, but there may be some teams involved in it too. So is there is there any advantage to having a little bit more technical aptitude in that class to be able to set the bike up. Um, you know, cause I, I compared to like Red Bull rookies where it seems like they can't really do anything to those bikes. They just have to ride them. Um, is, is that an, is that an issue at all? Well, I think everybody's kind of in the same boat. I'm sure. You're going to have some bigger teams that, you know, haul around a couple of these bikes, you know, f and participate in the series that have more experience, but um, you know, I remember when we started the, the championship, one of the issues Chuck Graves actually brought up was, you know, there's not enough te technical capabilities within the series. But I, as the series have grown, I think we're seeing, you know, uh, kind of a new generation of data people and, and people, you know, learning the ropes really of what it takes to go racing. You know, we saw that big time in the baggers class because that was a class where, you know, the bagger people didn't know about racing. They didn't know anything about it. Now you got some pretty professional outfits out there. So I think, um, uh, yeah, if, if you're a, a father and a brother trying to help the, the other brother become a, a talent cup, you know, champion, you're going to, you're going to be learning it all together, yeah. but at least you're, at least you're learning at a, at a, at a lower spot, I guess. Right. And yeah. it's things they need to learn if they're they going to learn it. Yeah, for sure. So if you're going to go to an except a super sport or twins, you still need to learn how to hundred percent. Yeah. You know, it helps the whole paddock. I mean, it's not only developing the next generation of riders, but the next generation of, you know, paddock Tuners, mechanics yeah. and, you know, all that crew chiefs and 100%. suspension guys and everything. I'm sure that's, that's interesting. That's, that's a good, I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to grasp you that. Remember that? Well, yeah. If, you, <laughs> yeah. if you wanted a career in the MotoGP paddock, that's the place I'd, try that's to go start yeah yeah because i think they make good money because there's not a lot of them and yeah for sure there's, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for that so yeah yeah for sure um so paul let's talk, <laughs> talk about let's talk about the calendar a little bit about next year um, well i think the biggest thing is that's going to make a lot of people happy is we're going back to vir yes the only person i think that's not happy because we're losing brainerd is bobby fong because he won all those races there. <laughs> <But> I, <laughs> and probably Rocco Landers, I think. Rocco, and Rocco, Rocco, Rocco yeah. Rocco. Oh, and Hayden Gillum. And Hayden Gillum. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, otherwise, I think, um, yeah, I think going back to VIR is cool. It's always been uh, it's always been one of my favorites. The people there are nice. I like the facilities, kind of got some soul to it. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good place. And, and the reason we stopped going there was really because of a date conflict <clears throat> with another event that VIR had to move. And we just couldn't find the the right spot for us, you know. And even even though next year it's going to be later in the year, I think it's in August. Um, you know, it's it's still going to be good to go back there. Um, Brainerd, personally, I enjoyed going to Brainerd as well. I like the the, the area. Uh, we had some good races there, had some good drama there, you know, at times. But you know, this year we had a date shift, you know, again because of a track conflict and, and it, it moved to an earlier time, which followed Road America. And anytime we have a date change, at, you know, and a dip in attendance, you know, we do see a dip in, in attendance with date changes. Um, we just weren't confident we would get that back when we moved, you know, if we went back to the, the old date. So, yeah, I think, I don't think people would realize, but I having those consistent dates has to be a big thing because. Sure. You know, people go, oh, Road America, it's the first weekend in yeah. June, you know, yeah. when, the last weekend in May or whatever, however it falls. But they can kind of count on that and not even have to wait for a schedule. Well, we see a big influx of campers coming. So if you're going to go plan a three-day weekend, you're, yeah. you're not looking at it the week before, are you? you know, no. you're, you're looking at it six months, almost a year, you know. I mean, we get people asking, you know, um, June, when's your schedule coming out so we could get tickets to Laguna Seca or to, you know, Road America, the, the super popular ones. So now Sean brought up, um, you know, looking back it, when we started, when we started, there was no way that I thought we were going to be ever doing the Daytona 200. Right. And here we are. And we've recently done a new contract with Daytona to run the Daytona 200 for another three years. Mm. And it's obviously proved to be popular for us. And I think it's, it's, we, we've got, we, we've t helped take that race back. It's in the right direction of where it used to be back when we all knew it as, you know, the biggest race in America. 
Yeah, it was funny because back when we, you know, back to the announcement in 2014, the first thing on the agenda was because I think DMG, <clears throat> at that time, if you remember, they had already announced they were going to race thousands again at Daytona, and there was a tire test scheduled for October. We took the series over in September, and the first thing, I think it was Mike Buckley, called and said, hey, are we having a tire test? It's like, dude, I haven't even got my feet wet here yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... You know, after a lot of debate and talking with the, the tracks and talking internally, we just, you know, it was going to be, it was going to be enough on our plate just to get the series up and running, you know, with our, with our sprint championship. And uh, so we decided to forego on the Daytona 200. But, you know, I guess I went back in 2021 and looked around and um, Scott Smart was, was there who was in charge of the FIM, you know, technical side. And we were talking about how the next gen class was going to evolve and what the idea and the concept with that was going to be. Um, I thought to me that, you know, and then after coming back and talk with Wayne and Richard and Terry, you know, that to me was a catalyst for the opportunity to take the 200 back because it was going to bring back, you know, some European manufacturers. If everybody, you know, from the world super sport championship was on pretty similar rules where they could just come over here and race it'd be an opportunity to get more Europeans back involved and, and to try and help elevate the, the race again. So I think it's worked out pretty good for the first uh, couple of years. You know, the first two years, I think, you know, it was a little bit of a learning experience between us and the Speedway. Um, you know, last year things went, went really smooth. Um, and it's, it's great that the, to me that, you know, the confidence that the Speedway has in us for the direction we want to take the 200 and, and you know, the cooperation there is, is really good. And uh, it's, you know, they're the, the good people to work with. And the rules, I mean, that place shows exactly what the rules are and how mm. much parity there is because it's like you're racing on a dyno almost. In a know? way, in a way, for sure. So, I mean, I mean that was a big test and, and, yeah. and it's worked out from day one. Yeah. And, you know, and also bringing in the king of the baggers, you know, so... You know, I think every each year we've seen the the attendance pretty much double. You know, each year that we've we we've, we've gone. And um, again, to me, I mean, you've been to the 200. I think both of you guys have for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's um, you know it's been the, one of the most historic motorcycle road races in history, basically. So I think for us, it's it's an honor to to be able to carry on that tradition and uh, to add our touch to it, and and hopefully you know continue to make it, you know make it better and better each year. So. You know, Chuck, you talk about Daytona. I've got a lot of photos of you from way back in the day, of course. When do you remember the first time you ever went to Daytona? How old you were and what why you were there? Um, I was I, first time I went was 1983. It's when Kenny rode the, they were on the 680s, I think. Yes, they yeah. were, 680s, yeah. those the two 680s, years. yeah. Yep. Um, and that, um, so I actually went to Europe with him that year. So we went to Daytona first. I was kind of, I was his motorhome driver then. He was going through a divorce and, you know, he needed just some help over there. I was racing motocross at that time. And so I helped, you know, we rode together a lot preparing for his last year. Um, so I went to Daytona with him and then from there went off to, to Europe and drove his motorhome around. So, wow. Okay. Um, but that was the first time I was there. Yeah. Yeah. And that 680 was, they only, that was a Daytona bike only. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then next year I went back, uh, yep. 84 and I raced, I actually raced the 250. Oh yeah, you did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was Skip in that race too, or was he No, Skip, back? Skip had stopped by then. Okay. Skip had retired before then. Okay. Um, but obviously Daytona is part of who you are for so long that it's cool that we're finally back there and you must have a good feeling about that just personally that it's back with us again. No, it's cool. And, and anytime you drive through the tunnel into the speedway, it's just like a wow, you know, yeah, no, every no time, no what. especially if you drive through the turn four tunnel and you see guys on the baking, if you're lucky enough to drive in at the right time, it's pretty cool. But yeah. that was the first place I ever went to in America. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'd never been, we'd never been to America. And the first place we went was Daytona. Wow. No, but that's cool. You know, it's like Paul's father, my father, you know, they, they went there, you know, probably not every year after that. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> Pretty much. So it's kind of cool the that, you know, we're working in the same environments. Our fathers, you know, came up in. Yeah. we're going to the same places. So it's, it's really neat. Yeah. It's really cool. So Chuck, this is a, this is a question out of the blue for you. Um, are, are leader bikes going away? 
Ooh. I'm probably not the one to, to ask that. Well, I mean, from what you've thought, because I keep wondering, and I'm not talking about in our series. I mean, it seems to be maybe MotoGP wants to be kind of the be all end all. So I keep hearing stuff about World Superbike. Maybe, you know, they may have some pressure on World Superbike to maybe not be leader bikes. And obviously we're related to World Superbike in a lot of ways with FIM stuff. Um, it just, it's happened before. I mean, and even what we had, we had 990s and, and what, 800s. Eight, yeah, yeah, 800s in Moto in MotoGP. Yeah. So it kind of goes up and down. Displacements change all the time anyway. Heck, Superbike was 750 at yeah. one point. So, I mean, it can change all the time. I just wonder... Um, if it's feeling like that again, it, I'm just wondering if that's kind of some talk. Yeah. Well, obviously MotoGP has announced they're going to go to 800 CCs again. Is it yeah. 800 or yeah. 850? I, th or, I think it is yeah. 800. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know, they're doing that to slow the, the bikes down, which I'm not sure if that'll do that or not, but, um, you know, super bike world, super bikes are only, you know, probably two seconds a lap slower. So if a MotoGP bike slows down, you can't have a World Superbike that's going to be faster than MotoGP. So I know there's some concern there. You know, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a solution. I know there's a lot of different avenues being looked at to slow World Superbikes down. Um, um, you know, it's, and, and part of that is, is not just the speeds, but also to try and bring in some, some new racetracks into the fold too, which, you know kind of adhere to themselves if the speeds are, are down, you know, for safety, safety reasons. So it's, it's hard to say, you know, I, I think the manufacturers are still selling thousands, probably not as many as they have in the past. Uh, you know, Yamaha announced the, you know, the R1, I think in Europe is just available for track day as a track day bike. Um, so I don't know. We, you know, we, again, we, we try and look into the future as much as we can, but also we try and follow what the FIM is doing as close as possible. Um, I don't think they have a set direction yet on what the, what methods are going to take to slow things down, whether it's, you know, f you know, restricting fuel or, or different tires or, or, or what for the world super bikes. But, um, you know, we'll watch it closely and just see what happens. So I, I wanted to touch on that about specifically about the R1. So the R6 in Supersport, we know that that became kind of a track only bike and it's still out there. So it sounds like that it looks like it's going to be phased out and there may be another model or it will be another model coming in. Um, but the R1 in the U in Europe is a track only model. They thought enough of us here in the U.S. They've got they've got a new street model of the R1. So there's a commitment in the U.S. to still have leader bikes, and sure. I'm sure it has something to do with us and super and our super bike. Well, possibly, but if you look around, you know BMW is still investing yes. in thousands, and you know Ducati is still investing in thousands, and you know we we know from conversations with some other manufacturers, they still prefer thousands here in America as a super bike class. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, where that leads to the next. You know, four or five years. Um, like you said, 750s used to be super, super bikes back in the day. You know, you already got what, 949 Ducatis, which is nearly a thousand anyway. Right. Um, I think a lot of it too depends, you know, what fans want to see as well, you know, because to me, a, a super bike sounds a lot different than a next gen super sport bike for yeah. sure. So part of that is the, the, the show. So I think all those things need to be considered. But Certainly a lot of what we do depends on, you know, as a reaction to what the FIM do. And so we just watch it close, see what happens. I want to, one, th one of the things I'm most proud about with Moto America, and it's, it's partially Twins Cup because we, we took a, a, a bike in a, in, a, in a class that was kind of a club thing. And we put these guys on a national stage and lo and behold, the manufacturers started making twin cylinder motorcycles, which they're still doing and going to continue to have. So Mission King of the Baggers. I mean, I, I watched a video of Tyler O'Hara the other day where he said something like, who would have thought this would happen? <laughs> and I mean, we still kind of it's it's still it's still a novelty. It's still incredible. And I'm I'm amazed every time they go out there, they get they go faster. Their lap times are quicker. They lean over more. I mean, is it even more amazing than you thought it would be? I would have never imagined, and it scares me a little bit to this day, that a 620-pound machine is doing 185 miles an hour on the banks of Daytona. Yes. And their lap times are, you know, would put them top 10 in a lot of the super sport uh, qualifying, and they would qualify for super bike races. So, 
yeah, it's incredible. The you know from where that started as just an exhibition class to what it's evolved to because now they're they're real race bikes. Right. Yeah. I think what it's evolved to is it's not a novelty anymore. Right. I like think it's it, a novelty to see because you don't see it anywhere else, but right. it's, it's the it's but, not a novelty of a bike anymore. Yeah, it's not novelty, silly novelty. No, no it's no. like this is a serious race class now with serious guys and yeah. obviously very serious manufacturers. Which I think right now, I think that's what really turns up the heat in that class is that you've got manufacturers there that really don't like each other. Oh yeah, and I've been <laughs> involved in racing you know, from the Grand Prix level to to here, obviously, and I've never seen a rivalry like Harley and Indian. Right, like even in our superbike, I don't think Yamaha and Ducati don't have that same feeling against each other like those those two. No, those two they guys. like to beat each other, but the it's Harley Indian <laughs> is it's a, it's different for sure. Right, like you could picture like their secretaries fighting, yeah, right, at the main yeah. office or something. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, and the thing I love about it, too, is it kind of started off where there were some riders that had raced in a lot of di different series uh, classes in Moto America and started riding in, in King of the Baggers and still do Kyle Wyman, Tyler O'Hara. Yeah. But now you've got like got guys like kids like, you know, 19 year old Rocco Landers, who you wonder like how he how he feels about that bike because he's young. He won a race. He loves racing that bike. Yeah. I mean, anybody that gets on those things seems to seems to just enjoy racing them. Well, again, I think it comes back to the seriousness now of the class. You know, when you got, you know, Indians looking for new young talent, Harley's looking for new young talent, you know, because it's, you know, Terry Vance, obviously the champions from uh, last year. Um, you know, they're looking to put on riders that can win. And so it's 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 gone from, like like we said before, a, a novelty, a fun race, and it's go out, you know, now it's, now it's pretty serious. And, you know, give both India and Harley a lot of credit. I mean, they were known for the first couple of years as, you know, they're just laying oil down all over the place. And, right. you know, the last two years, we probably had more oil downs from sport bikes than we have from the baggers. Right. So I don't right. think they get enough credit for that, to be honest. But they've and that's a, lot, a class, a work. that's a class where the whole win on Sunday, sell on Monday thing still, actually yeah. still works. Yep, for sure. Yep. Have you been have you been pretty pleased with next gener super sport next generation the way it's going? Yeah, I mean everybody that doesn't win complains that you yeah, know, the other yeah, teams are a favorite, but <laughs> you know, I see the dyno charts and I see all the stuff that Teague's looking at and it's it's close, you know. Yeah. It's uh and I think it's you know, each bike is is different, they're unique. You, know, you got seven fifties against, you know, the the nine four nines and you got triumphs in there sometimes. It's so you're gonna get you're going to have advantages and disadvantages just on a level of equipment, depending on what track you go to. Right. So sometimes that's what you see coming out. But, you know, like after Road America, there was, you know, teams complaining about my bike, you know, had a disadvantage and he had the closest finish in history with three different manufacturers yes. across the line. So, no, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's done, done well for, you know, it is a balancing class. That's the nature of it. I think, uh, Teague and the FIM guys, um, have done a good job in the balancing aspect and it's brought in more interest, more manufacturers. And it's, it's, uh, it's also brought the cost down for competing in super sport class, to be honest. So that's another plus. That's good. Yeah. And that's I really think good. if, if super bike rules did change, don't you think they'll, they would ultimately end up being a balancing class as well? Maybe, but you know, it seems like whenever, no matter what the super bike class is, like even where next gen started, it's already evolved a couple steps to make it more expensive than what it originally was. So it's not to say that if that was a super bike class, it's going to be cheaper because there'll probably be some rules that come in to make it more expensive. So then right. you're just back to where you started. You know? Right. And I, that's why, I mean, you know, personally, I hope there's always the super bike class the way that it is because yeah. I like to have one class where it's just like a little bit open, gas yeah, it up go, and go, yeah. you know, yeah, and some uh, ingenuity, some engineering could come into it. And I think, yeah. and I think, you know, when you look at like, oh, well, motorcycle sales aren't doing this and motorcycle sales aren't doing that, I, I don't, as the guy that watches and wants Yamaha to win a super bike race. He's not he he's not necessarily going to buy an R1. He might buy it, you know their smallest capacity bike or their motocross bike because I think it's a an image thing more than anything. Yeah, same as MotoGP. Right, right? you can't buy a MotoGP bike. It's about who you favor because the in image technology. Yeah, it could be the rider. It could be the brand of bike. It. Yeah, for sure. I yeah, agree. and and Superbike Steel Commander Superbike. It is st it is our premier racing class. It is. Yep. It will be. Continues to be. That's how we started. And we, we love it that way because, I mean, it does have our best and brightest talent for sure. So, um, 
Yeah, and it definitely, you know, there's a lot of debate because the baggers are popular, yep. super sports popular. But if you go look at TV numbers, social media numbers, super bike still the king. People are watching yeah. that more than anything. So, yeah. Hey, Chuck, race three at Coda. Three, three former Moto2 riders out there going for it. That race was crazy. It looked like a Moto2 race. I thought all the races were good. Yeah, they know, were all good. Sure. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's one of the... One of the high points of this year is seeing a team like Top Pro enter and and Sean Dillon Kelly kind of arriving on the scene. So yeah. I think there's some big things in store for him in the future for sure. Yeah, I and agree. it also shows that that some guys knowing what they're doing can show up in their first year and race superbikes. And you know, a lot of things it's like, oh, you can't race superbike because we can't do this, we can't compete. Well, they show that you can compete. It's a lot different than it was 20 years ago. I think. Yeah, 100. Yeah, percent sure. Yeah. Yeah, all the equipment is available. It's just up to you to put together the right package and right rider and right right crew. But the equipment's there to do it. So let's talk about TV a little bit. One of the things that Chuck has become kind of with Moto America is he's our broadcast czar, our TV <laughs> czar de- a little by, bit. By default. <laughs> well, yeah, how did that happen? I mean, you're like the guy now for broadcast. Anywhere around the world we can a- ask you about, like, where should we be on, you know, or where should we watch <laughs> I don't know. and live plus and all that. It's just you, another part of the evolution, I guess. Yeah. But I mean, that is what a big part of what you, you're doing is, is working through all that stuff. Right. Yeah. It kind of started, you know, we had to deal with BN sports and that, that came to an end and it was like, what are we going to do now? And nothing was happening. So I just started picking up the phone and making contacts and calling. And, and so that's how it, it evolved into my job, I guess. So. Um, and it's an, it's another chat, you know, challenge, but it's, um, I think we've done pretty good, you know, trying to spread out the coverage and really to, you know, what that does is build awareness of Moto America in general. Um, you know, we're on, you know, two different linear networks. Technically we've started our own fast channel, you know, we started on fast channel motorsport one really, you know, because, you know, back in initially when I'm looking around, you're looking at how many households of Fox Sports 2 have, how many Fox Sports 1 and and different platforms. But um, John Duff, who, you know, had a stint with BN Sports, that's where we first met him. He went to work for Mav TV and then he started talking to us about the fast channel side and what that was developing into. And all of a sudden we saw a opportunity where we could develop our own households, you know, and. I think soon uh, Motorsport One with some some things that are going to be happening in the future. You know, we're going to have access to you know 250 million homes here. You know, pretty soon. So that's on its own. It's a bigger network than many of them we already deal with. So man, the whole thing is like a brave new world, though. You know, you see some people on Facebook that make comments about us being on like primetime TV or something. It's gotten to the point where what is primetime TV anymore? We're sure, all looking right. for different applications. I mean, Thursday night, tonight's football game is on Am- prime. Am- Amazon. Yeah, right? it's yeah. on Amazon. So yeah. we're all kind of consuming our, our, our entertainment differently now. And this kind of dovetails with that. So I don't know. I, I think it's people that just think it's going to go back to what it is. And it's just not. No, I mean, especially younger generation, you know, they take in their content much different than we, we do. You know, right. there's still the traditional people that look for ABC, NBC, CBS, and I'd say most of the population doesn't do that anymore, to yeah. be honest. So it's a um, fast-moving world for sure. You know, even that, you know, being involved with the Fast Channel stuff, from where it started to where it is now, you know, when we started the started the project, it was, you know, a limited number of channels and now if you go on sling or lg tv or any of them there's thousands of them so that's eventually going to weed itself out to the ones people really want to watch and hopefully the you know we think the quality of our network and also having some moto america live racing on it and other motorsports applied to motorsport one that's gonna you know it's a good quality station so people are going to want to look at it for sure but yeah it's uh, that landscape is tough to keep up with and yeah. then you know, YouTube's probably the biggest network, right? Right. So, um, yeah, it's an ever-changing landscape. For We're sure. lucky he's our guy on this. But he should have – I remember – this is funny because this piece of advice came from Richard Varner, who wouldn't you wouldn't think would give an employee this <laughs> advice. But I was sweeping the warehouse in our Costa Mesa office like the first or second year, and he said, Paul – Oh yeah, yeah. Never, never do a shitty job well. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Chuck's kind of fallen into that, and now he's going to be our TV guy forever. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's people that could do it much better than me, but I think you know, to, to where we are, I've done okay. 
I mean, but what a feather in your cap, though. And like you said, you you know, every day is some, kind of something new for you. And at this point in your career, in your life, it's cool that you're still, you know, picking up on things and continuing. It keeps you young, Chuck. I guess. I don't think I look so young anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know what the next step to evolve to would be. But, you know, it's always a surprise around the corner, I'm sure. That's where the young people step up. Yeah. They make right. the decisions on the next thing. <laughs> yeah. You just have to kind of learn when yeah. they do it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, so Live Plus, our st subscription streaming service. Yep. Are you pleased with it? Are, are are you happy with the progression of it? Are there some things you wish were were better? Everything can always be improved. I know that. But, you know, how do you feel about it in general? I think in general, it's it's good, to be honest. I think I'm surprised by the number of people. It's it's 20 plus hours of content on a weekend and the majority of the people that watch it, watch it all. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, selling subscriptions is not easy. We've learned that. Um, but we, we do improve year on year, a uh, pretty substantial amount. I always look at it as a goal. You know, we have three, three and a half million followers. And if we can get 10% of those people subscribing, then, you know, that would be great for not only us, but for the sport, because it would provide some good opportunities, uh, to put back into the, the paddock as well. Um, but it's not easy. That's a whole nother lane. You know, a lot of specialized people trying to do the same thing and, um, you know, again, I think it's a, it's, we've given our fans a, a choice. You know, you could watch a half hour or hour program on superbike racing on Fox or on Mav TV or, or whatever. But if you want to watch the whole weekend, if you can't make it to a race, we want you to feel like you're there still. And that's why we have, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, paddock talk, Mike on the mic, you know, going around in the paddock, you know, asking teams and riders and fans, you know, questions about being there. We really would like, you know, for fans at home to experience what it's like to be at the track and I hope they, they come out or if they do come to a number of races, then they're not missing out either, you know? So yeah, in general, I'm, uh, I'm happy with it, happy with the production, always things we could look at to improve, but in general, it's, I think it's going well. I mean, the three of us can remember back when I remember you could maybe watch one or two motorcycle races a year on TV. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and like, like super waiting, bikers. waiting for wide world of sports. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You, and, and nowadays it, it, it's, it just kills me when people complain about something that they get now, because like he said, you could sit there and watch 20 hours of, of yeah. Moto America coverage. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and you see amazing. so much, I mean, you learn so much about the riders that you couldn't learn about in the past. Yeah. I mean, you talk about 83, 84 and Daytona, I think that was on wide world of sports. I'm pretty sure. I think that was one thing that they did and broadcast it later on. Well, yeah, and it would all—it would have only been the Daytona 200 too. Yes, you know we're here. We have coverage yes. of Twins Cup. You know it'll be Talent Cup, Junior Cup. You know all the classes have coverage now. So, yeah, back in the day, you'd have the one main race, and nobody would even know what else was running. So. Yeah. The, so, Chuck, this matrix that we have, where we've arrived at this idea that su Super Sport actually is at every round um super bikes at every round June, well next year talent cup won't be um the other classes aren't at every round that entire matrix how do you do that how do you how does how do you make those decisions it has to be somewhat logistics isn't it for these teams that like you don't want to have them go to laguna seca and then come to new jersey next the next week or you know i don't mean that well, but some know, of us started that way certainly we saw you know we when we first started doing it, we moved the Junior Cup to more East Coast type series, and and the uh, number of participants was kind of on the downturn. And then when we did that, it it shot up again, and probably a lot of that was due to the travel, you know, part in it. But for the Talent Cup, it's a little bit different goals because we want those kids to race. Yes. So, but we are still trying to do the same same concept. Um, you know, we do have five rounds that are going to be with us. Uh, there's going to be a, uh, the actually the very first race. We're putting them really in the deep end, but it's going to be in conjunction with MotoGP at Coda, and then we're going to have an extra event uh, with the Vintage Motorcycle Days at Mid Ohio. So we're going to have seven rounds, 14 races for them, but trying to also keep them more on the east side, you know, the United States for the, for the cost side. Uh, we try to do a little bit the same with with Twins and Stock Thousand, but. Then we had complaints that, well, how come we never get to race at Laguna or how come we don't? So now we're trying to just, you know, give them some variety and, and swap them around a little bit year on year. So at least they, you know, get to experience all the tracks if they're in the program for a couple of years. Which track is the 
one that most people want to ride is it laguna just because of its history and I stuff think laguna road america yeah as yeah well. road yeah. yeah yeah that's true so there you go you gotta have like 15 races at those two i, I think <laughs> mid ohio is a popular one now oh yeah oh for sure. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we knew it was all along. It's just, man, once now that we, and it lived up to its billing this year. And yeah, it was sure. crazy how many yep. people were there. Yeah, it was good. I, I want to touch on uh, Mini Cup a little bit um, for next year. This you, you did something different this year. We did something different in this regional idea that boiled down to a national. Um, it was kind of in its infancy. We had to see how it was going to go. You know, my, I'm sure next year it's going to be bigger and better. There's going to be more of that. Can you tell us? How that went, and if it, if it's living up to what you want it to be, and there's more to come. Uh, yeah, the, you know that's a that's been a challenge for us over the last few years is how to how to operate that program properly. And part of the challenge with it is, you know, it started with the goal to qualify kids to go to the FIM Mini GP World Championship, which is held in Valencia each year. Uh, but a couple of years ago, Dorn implemented the that series is owned by Pirelli. And so Dunlop is obviously our tire yeah. supplier and sponsor and sponsor of our mini cup program as well. So, um, you know, two years ago we would run a Pirelli day on Friday and, a and Dunlop day on Saturday. And it just got to be a kind of a headache <laughs> and a mess. And it's, it's, you know, it's just a big undertaking to run a lot of those mini cup events on our own. So, Last year, we took a look at what's the most successful amateur program, and that's amateur motocross. You know, they have all these qualifiers, regional qualifiers, and it all culminates going to Loretta Lens, you know, for the national championship. So, so we started that process. I had six to seven clubs involved uh, last year doing qualifiers. We had a national final at Road America. Uh, we'll be doing that same thing uh, next year. You know, we did stream the mini mini cup championships. Uh, so if you go on YouTube, I think it's there mm -hmm. and live plus. Um, and I think after people saw how it happened, I mean, the, the entries were kind of limited for the national, but now I think that they see that the concept next year, it's going to be much bigger, I think. And, and uh, talking with sponsors are, you know, much more enthused about it and, and see the potential in it. And, um, yeah, so here in the next couple of months, we'll be making contact to more clubs to be involved. And, and again, it's starting at the bottom, but there's a lot of incentive. We want to create some incentive for the kids that want to go from mini cup to talent cup. Um, you know, so there's some programs that'll be in place there. And, um, yeah, you know, bottom line is we're trying to create a bigger funnel to get more kids involved to, you know, progress to what they want to do on the national or world stage. So would there be anything with mini cup that would, I don't know what this is. I'm just kind of thinking out loud mini cup and its relationship to talent cup, maybe something that is an incentive to you do this. There's something about going to talent cup or whatever. Well, for the one, one, the main class is the 190 and 160. If you're the champion of that and you're of age, you want to go to the Talent Cup, you'll have a free entry for a Talent Cup. Yes. So, um, you know, we're working with Kramer to make a bike available. So if there's, you know, maybe there'll be in some, some incentive for one of those kids to, you know, have the use of a bike in the future, you know, like a wild like that. car, you mean? Or for the season, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, there's some ideas being kicked around for that, but you know, that's where we want to see the you know five year olds come up through the mini cup and then transition to the talent cup and, and go from there. So we're trying to build some incentive to to help kids out that want to do that for sure. With the talent cup, I mean, I think the the ultimate thing would be like if HSBK has a talent cup bike out of their awning, out of their garage, yeah, and they have a young kid on that, and it's you could paint it, you could say Ducati on it. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And those are some ideas we've kicked around with some of the MotoGP teams, you know, because I think especially with Liberty's involvement with Dorna now, um, there seems to be a lot of attention on having America, you know, America is the biggest market for MotoGP. It's still relatively untapped, right? Right. And so, you know, I think the question for over there is where's the Americans going to come from? You know, we need more Americans over here. So if we could get that connection with the Ducatis or the Yamahas or, you know, track house is another good example. If we get them involved with partnering with existing teams or starting a program to support, um, you know, some of the the uh, talent cup, you know, riders, that would I think that'd be great. It'd be great to see, you know, look alike MotoGP bikes running around in our talent cup series for yeah, sure. Yeah, be cool. Yeah. 
<clears throat> All right, Chuck, we're getting towards the end here, but I, I want to talk. So this episode and at the top, we said, you know, Paul's going on his honeymoon, so we needed to put one in the can. So he's on the beach or wherever he is. He's going to Italy, I think. Sorry, Paul, I'm revealing where you are going to be. So everybody's <laughs> yeah, going to I'm follow. sure people are going to hunt me down. Yeah, and get an they autograph. are. They are. I know I am. <laughs> but but at any rate, um, what, what I was getting at is when this when Paul's gone and when this airs, it's going to be kind of in the midst of pressure to rise and pressure to rise has changed this year it used to be the thursday prior to every one of our rounds and steve radley would go into a room in between rounds he never liked it when it was when we had only one weekend off because he was in a closet (laughs) yeah so now it's been it's had been it's been worked on all the during the entire year i think we're going to have 12 episodes and it's um it's a different thing it's after the season so it's a little more like what F1 does, MotoGP does, it's a little bit, it's something sep- It's something to look at during the winter, I guess, a docu-series. So is that is that the intention, is to kind of provide, you know, keep it going? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Steve does a great job with the, with the program. I think this is the third probably iteration of the format that we've yes. tried. Uh, this, this year's uh, format will be more focused on a certain number of riders instead of a total class or... Uh, but I've seen, you know, what he's what he's done. It's it's really good. He's doing a lot more visits in home, uh, a lot more behind the scenes stuff. It's going to be really good. But uh, we and thought, and it's not just Superbike this now. No, it's not a text yeah. on three classes, I guess. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But good personalities that are involved, definitely. But yeah, you know, in the beginning, it was, you know, pressure to rise was used to kind of lead into what the weekend's race was going to be, and that's right. why we showed on the Thursday and and try and build up into the weekend, but. You know, for this year, we decided, you know, once our season stops here, there's not much content that'll be going out. We will, you know, put some older races uh, that happen throughout the year on YouTube and so forth. But this will be new content that people can enjoy, you know, through the winter months. And it's going to more build up towards Daytona rather than, you know, Daytona will be the next race that kind of leads into. So I think people will enjoy it. It'll be good, uh, good off season content to tune back in and see what's happening with Moto America. One of the previous things I liked about the previous iteration of it was, man, you hear some of the crew guys and stuff when they're mic'd up. And I mean, they it's, they, they do a good job being yeah. selective because there are some things. Is it still going to have a lot of that behind the scenes stuff? Uh, I think so. Yeah. From what I've seen it. Well, yeah, definitely. That stuff is good. I mean, I give such insight. And in talking to the crew chiefs and reaction, you know, the, the crew chief part is interesting to me about, you know, working with the riders and. Uh, again, Steve does, you know, and Hannah and everybody part of the program does a good job of bringing, you know, all that information out of the crew chiefs or the team owners. And uh, it's it's good. It's it's I like that kind of stuff almost as much as the racing, to be honest with you. So. Yeah, it's something we're going to look forward to for yeah. sure. So, um, all right, we're going to get out of here, Chuck. Um, I, I know I could have asked you some more, but we'll save it. We'll get a save it. Union. Save it till next year. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. T- we'll talk to you next September. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to it. <laughs> but um, you know, so obviously our season will be over by the time you you see this. But it's we're excited to be here at New Jersey, and for this final round, we've got some classes that are really coming right down to the wire. A couple points difference, and uh, in in some of our classes, so um, it's going to be fun and. It'll all be done and dusted by the time you guys see this, but we're, we're on the verge of some excitement this weekend. So thanks for joining us on this episode. Thank you, Chuck and yep. thanks. Paul. And Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Paul. Right. Hey, I have a Doberman at my house, so don't go rob me when I'm gone on this honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's going to feed it? Uh, <laughs> no comment. That's, Paul, that's what I was afraid of. I went and told everybody that you're not going to be for a while. That was a bad move on my part. I have a I'm really sorry. big neighbor with a big gun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. Thank you. Thanks.